The former counter-terrorism bill enabling internal exile of UK terror suspects is set to be reinstated after UK Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg dropped opposition to the measure. However, as Huda al Said explains, although compromising on the relocation measures, internal exile has drawn criticism which claims that it will erode civil liberties. It's a step that could impose internal exile on British citizens suspected of terror-related activities. The new UK anti-terror law has the power to force terrorism suspects to relocate to another part of Britain. The measures were revived after a backtrack by the very man who decided they were a step too far. British Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg conceded after securing changes to the existing system of terrorism prevention and investigation measures known as TPIMS. But what exactly has been revised? Scrapped in 2011, the revived relocation powers will allow the Home Secretary and MI5 decide on rural locations where suspects could be moved from metropolitan cities like London, Birmingham and Manchester. Instead of imposing restrictions on the area where a suspect can travel within a big city, the revised relocation measures would supposedly cut the suspect's links to extremist networks more effectively. The relocation laws do come with caution, however, as outlined by a Liberal Democrat spokesperson who says, moving people against their will from one part of the country to another is a significant imposition on their liberty. But that is exactly why the Liberal Democrats believe they can only be introduced alongside a higher burden of proof to ensure they are only used where absolutely necessary and in a tiny number of cases. Essentially, the measures will be part of a new counter-terror bill to be released next week, which will also seek an introduction of a more specific definition of terrorism-related activity to ensure that TPIMs are not being abused. The need to improve anti-terror legislation comes from fears of UK extremist fighters returning from Syria. But the new measures are also increasing fears that their introduction will erode civil liberties. Now, to discuss this issue with us further is Head of Research at the IHRC, that's the Islamic Human Rights Commission, Mrs. Arzu Mirali, who joins us live on Skype. Uh, Mrs. Mirali, relocation laws would supposedly cut the suspects' links to extremist networks in bigger cities. Now, do you think that's the case, firstly? Well, you know, we have to see the details of this. We've had sort of similar measures before in the old regime where we had control orders, and supposedly these were cutting off people from a network of uh, terrorists, et cetera, et cetera. But what we essentially found was that, you know, the person who's under control order, in this case a TPIM that has been beefed up and they've been sent off into internal exile, they would have had to have had their internet, their phones, their communications all blocked off for any kind of communication to be curtailed with anyone. And the people who suffer the most are spouses and especially children who can't interact normally in society. At the same time, we're failing to see any kind of real evidence from the government that any of these measures over the last actually something like 15 years have actually stopped any terrorism anywhere. So, so, what, so you know, why did Nick Clegg uh, decide to reinstate it then? Well, I mean, there's obviously lots of trade-offs and politics being played. We're in the run-up to a general election. On one hand, he wants to appeal uh, back to his old constituency of Liberal, uh, liberal supporters who are very much concerned about civil liberties and the erosion of those under successive governments. And there's any number of reasons, but I think we need to completely scroll back and ask the question why we need these types of laws and policies which do not actually put people through the normal processes of law. You know, there are plenty of laws, criminal laws, to prosecute people for inciting murder, uh, preparing acts to murder people or permit, you know, preparing for violent acts. We don't need terrorism laws which actually stop being, people being prosecuted and being tried in front of a judge, a judge and jury. And this is what the anti-terrorism laws uh, Mrs. do. Mrs. Morale, if, if I could just stop you there. Uh, we've just sort of entered into my next question, which I wanted to ask. I mean, how effective then will passport seizing and the rest of the new measures be in effectively, effectively tackling UK terror threats? You know, I really wonder, as I've said, you know, we really are lacking in proper data that says, you know what, because we had these laws, such and such has been prevented. We're not really getting that. What we do get is an awful lot of scare stories. But when you look at actual things that are happening on the ground, for example, this idea of seizing passports, you know, people have been going up and down to Syria to fight 
with the full knowledge of MI5, you know, really it's all about whether they're allowed to go or not to go. It's really got nothing to do with whether you, you know, grab their passport to prevent them or not. People are finding ways to move and not move according to the dictates, political dictates of the time. So really and truly, I find this to be a disingenuous kind of uh, discussion. What it does do is hype up fear amongst the general public and including that Muslim communities, you know, we all get hyped up, you know, whipped up into this frenzy of mm -hmm. fear, uh, which allows more and more draconian laws to be introduced. It closes down public debate on very serious issues about foreign policy, mm -hmm. and it allows foreign interventions without much criticism. Right. I mean, critics do say that the measures of relocation will restrict an individual's liberty. But, uh, Mrs. Morali, if, uh, if a British citizen decides to travel and be trained by extremists only to return and exert terrorism here, do they deserve liberty? Well, I think we have to wonder, first of all, you know, again, it seems unlikely most of analysts, even people who are particularly aggressive, are saying they don't think people who are going to be coming back are going to be, you know, committing acts of terrorism here. They went almost incited by the discourse here to fight over there, not to fight here. But let's leave that aside. Mm -hmm. As I said before, plenty laws exist. If you think somebody has committed a crime, if you have evidence that he's committed a crime or, you know, that he was going to or she was going to actually commit a crime, you can arrest them, you can prosecute them, they can be taken to court, and, and you know all the evidence can be laid in front of a judge and jury, and they can be imprisoned if they're found guilty. We don't need these measures, which simply because you don't like the look of a person or you feel suspicious of them, or you even enact mm -hmm. what Nick Clegg is saying, the balance of probabilities, well, they might or they might not be yes. a terrorist. Yes. And somehow which, you know, put them into internal which, which does bring me on to my next question as well, Mrs. Uh, uh, Morali. Anti-terror laws in the UK, uh, they do dictate that police have the power to stop anyone on the basis of a reasonable belief of terrorism activity. Now, how would that differ with the new measures of the balance of probability of the terrorism activity, as you mentioned? Balance of probabilities is the standard of proof, not in criminal cases in this country, but in civil cases. So, uh, you know, in, a, in front of a court, in a civil matter, some sort of proceeding, let's say, you know, suing somebody for negligence or whatever, uh, a judge would have to kind of think, well, what is most likely? Again, really, it's not satisfactory. If you're going to be charging people or talking about things which are ultimately criminal acts, you need to be looking at that burden of proof. But as I mentioned before, and I think I can't emphasize it enough, we've got a completely different system here that's tarnishing people with the brush and suspicion of terrorism mm -hmm. Uh, and not putting them through the court system and actually imprisoning them without trial, whether it's an internal uh, exile or any other of the methods that are suggested. Put these people through the courts if they've done something or you can reasonably su uh, suspect or prove that they've done something. Don't do this. This is, you know, second-class justice for demonized communities. Right the primary one of which are Muslims. We're just going to have to leave it there. Um, that was the head of research at IHRC, Mrs. Arzu Murali. Thank you very much for your time. 